turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, starting in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven. Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, one of the uh, wonders of what we've been exploring in this chapter of the confession is the truth, the reality that you are a God who keeps his promises. You are the promise-keeping God. You have never failed to keep your promises. You've never failed in any of the covenants that you've made with man. Man has failed. Man has not kept his promises, his obligations, but... Never once have you failed and had to try a plan B or anything to that extent. You cannot fail. You are God. It is impossible for you to fail. And we, re we rejoice in, in, in the fact that we are recipients of, of these truths, that we can know and be confident in, in who our God is because of what you have revealed in your word and, and what uh, our forebears have, uh, has, have systematized for us in the confession. Praise you, Almighty God, because you are the promise-keeping God. May that uh, teach us how to look back on all of history, and may that teach us how to think about our current context, may it, may it teach us how to view the world, and may your faithfulness in keeping your promises teach us how to, see the, how to anticipate the future, how to anticipate what is yet to come. All that you have promised has come to pass, 
or will come to pass because you are the promise keeping God. We love you and praise you and ask that, that now that the, the, the preaching of, the, of your word as we have enjoyed the singing of it and the praying of it, that now the preaching of your word would be pleasing in your sight. That it would be clear and edifying for your saints. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Charles Spurgeon once told a story of an old preacher, an old minister, who sat in one time to listen to a young preacher's sermon. So an old preacher came in and sat down and listened to a young preacher's sermon. And after the sermon, the younger preacher asked the older for a, re a review. What did you think of my sermon? This was actually very common back in the day. An older preacher and a younger preacher would travel together and they'd take turns preaching in the well, usually, usually the older would be the more experienced, and he would critique the younger. Well, the answer was a little slow in coming. And at last, the older said to the younger, If I must tell you, I did not like it at all. And there's a place for that kind of criticism, by the way. There was no Christ in your sermon. That's the place for criticism like that. You hear a sermon in it where there's no Christ in it, you should uh, feel free to say, I did not like it at all. No, answered the young man, because I did not see that Christ was in the text. Oh, said the old minister, but you do not know, or do you not know, that from every little town and village and tiny hamlet in England, there is a road leading to London? Do you not know that in England every, every road, even every path, leads to London? Whenever I get a hold of a text, I say to myself, there is a road from here to Jesus Christ, and I mean to keep on his track till I get at him. Well, said the young man, but suppose you are preaching from a text that says nothing about Christ. Then I will go over hedge and ditch but I will get at it. Amen. We begin with this anecdote. I believe it's a true story. We begin with this because it's really at this point in our understanding or our uh, survey of God's covenants, of divine covenants, that there's a lot of confusion. This is really where, in many cases, most of the confusion begins. And some of you may be familiar with what I'm about to describe. Um, some of the confusion I, I grew up in. Uh, maybe some of it will be familiar to you. If not, then praise God. Just uh, listen along and then be on your guard uh, in the future. So far, we have looked directly at two covenants, right? Two covenants. We looked at the Adamic covenant and the Noahic covenant. And they can both really be summed up rather simply. Uh, both of them can actually be summed up rather simply, though we spent a whole sermon on each. They could really be summed up rather simply. And you'll know their summaries, or at least you'll agree with these summaries if I've been faithful to my purpose as a preacher. All right, so the Adamic covenant could be summed up really simply in there is a Savior coming, or the Savior is coming, or a Savior is coming. Right? Very general, very uh, uh, light shadow. Right? Not much is said, but, there, but it, there, it is known there is a Savior coming. The Noahic covenant could be summed up just as simply, the Savior is still coming. Right, The Savior is still coming. Though man had completely and utterly rebelled and gone into wickedness, and God was going to destroy the whole earth, the Savior is still coming. God's not going to fail in his promises. And it's all about Christ, though. That, that's our point. As you heard this morning in the sermon, there's going to actually be a lot of great uh, reiteration from this morning. Divine uh, uh, revelation of history, it's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. And any theological system that makes anything, as we heard this morning, or anyone else the center of focus, any theological system that would remove Christ from the center of focus, by that standard alone, should be denied. Right? Just by that standard. As one runs from a snake in the grass, you should flee. You should run from a theological system that removes Christ from his throne at the center of redemptive history. Amen. It can't possibly be. 
revealed of God. When people go to a country music concert, I, I've tried to be a little more relevant in my, uh, or my allegories here, my uh, ways to explain things. I've never been to a country music concert, but um, when people do go to one, who, who do they go to see? They go to see the country music artist, right? They go to see the country music artist. Sometimes a drummer or a guitarist uh, may also be of, of some interest, right? So they might go to see him too, but uh, mostly they go to see the country music artist, usually the singer. Uh, and, and without him, without the artist, really the rest would be pointless, wouldn't it? The, the concert would be pointless. No one goes to the concert to see, you know, the light technician or, or the sound technician or the head of security. Man, I'm going to go to this you know, country music concert to talk to the head of security. He's, he's a really awesome guy. No one does that. They go to see the artist. And so while some of what we may see in, in Scripture this week as we study what the confession has to say um, may be offensive to some evangelical minds today, they're going to have to forgive us for not getting so excited about the bus and the driver, right? They, they got the, the artist to the concert, that served as transportation to get the artist to the concert. We're just not that excited about it. We're not that stoked about the bus driver or the bus. We want to see the artist himself. Today, many would have the bus brought right up on the stage, right? Center stage, an ensemble, flashing lights, you know, fog machines, smoke, and applause, while the artist remains behind the curtain. That's how many uh, people in the church today would, would teach these portions of scripture that we're about to to explore. They would say, look, it's all about the bus. It's all about the bus driver. You know, he'd step out of the bus and there'd be applause. That's how it is in most churches today. But we, as members of the new covenant of grace, we members of the new covenant know that though Christ was revealed in shadows in the former covenants, yes, he was revealed in shadows. He is no longer in the shadows, right? Amen? He's no longer in the shadows, we need not and ought not keep him there. The covenants are the buses that transport the country music artist. They're the means through which Jesus Christ would come, through which the offspring of the woman would come, the Messiah would come, who would suffer and save and ultimately be exalted. This was the purpose of these covenants. And so let us not put anything else on the stage, nothing else on the stage, not an ethnic people, not bloodlines, not genealogies, not earthly kingdoms, nothing temporal, nothing sa not, not sacrificial and ceremonial uh, practices, anything. Let's not put anything else center stage where the artist should be. Amen. Amen. If we can keep this in mind, we'll do well as we seek to understand the next covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. We may safely, with this in mind, turn our focus to the next covenant divine covenant. And just as we summed up the first two covenants rather simply, with Jesus Christ as the center, which is where we're going to stake our flag, right? We're going to keep, keep Christ as the, as the center. We're going to recognize him as the center. He's been, he is the center. We simply recognize him as the center. So this covenant as well can be briefly summarized, and I, I, I would say it could be summarized like this. The Savior is coming this way. All right? He's coming this way. So there's a Savior coming, that he's still coming, and he's coming this way. He's coming from this way. That could be a simple summary of the Abrahamic covenant. A lookout on a ship would often weary his eyes if he looked for long periods of time trying to find land. Uh, someone lost in a desert right, might lose hope over time, straining their eyes, uh, trying to find somewhere in this endless horizon where there might be uh, some hope of, of, of water or sustenance. And so the faithful people of God throughout the ages may have given into despair if God had not revealed from whence the Savior would come, had not revealed how he was going to bring about the offspring of the woman. And it is in the Abrahamic covenant which functions, functions really as the beginning of what we commonly refer to as the Old uh, Covenant. You may hear refer to it as the Old Covenant. It is in the, in the Abrahamic Covenant that the path of the coming Messiah is revealed. All right, This is the revealing of the path of the coming Messiah. This is, this is where he is coming from. 
It is a path that will pass through a family, through a nation, and through a kingdom. And so, in order to strive to begin to see that path, let's turn now to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12, we see the covenanter at work once again. The divine covenanter is at work once again. Truly, he never slumbers or sleeps, Psalm 121, verse 4. And though from a human perspective he at times seems silent, he is always active. He is never inactive. The, the divine covenanter, the God of the universe, is never inactive. Though the inhabitants of the earth cannot at times uh, observe the sun, right? though we sometimes can't see the sun uh, due to our respective vantage points uh, and, and in our cycles of rotation around the sun, in other, words, in other words, when it's night, we cannot see the sun, right? I don't know who wrote that. When it's night, sometimes we can't see the sun. In a, in a similar way, sometimes we can't see the works of God. We can't see that he is at work. But he is no less active in those seasons than... than <clears throat> When he is active, when we can see that he's active, just like the sun is no less active in giving out the radiance of his light and his heat uh, when it is night, when we can't see it. God's benevolence is always at work. His sovereignty, his providence is always at work. Now, in verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So what we've just read in this passage, and we're going to get back to the first text that we uh, read, but what we just read in this passage is, is, could be called the initiation of the Abrahamic covenant. All right? This is the initiation of the Abrahamic covenant. It will be expanded or expounded upon in future chapters, but this is really where it's initiated, Genesis chapter 12. But before we start putting together the, the puzzle, right? before we start putting together the puzzle, let's stop again and, and look at the cover of the box. I know some of y'all do that back there. You, you might try to say you don't look at the cover of the box, but I see y'all. Some people say it's cheating. Tracy, I think, says it's cheating to look at the cover of the box. Yeah, so it's not. We're going to look at the cover of the box so we can be reminded of what the picture is that we're that we're trying to put together, right? What we're trying to assemble. If so, if someone begins with the wrong picture in their mind of what the puzzle is supposed to be when we're, when you're completed with it, if you start with a wrong picture, the assembly will be extremely confusing. And if you're like my kids, they'll try to force pieces into the wrong places. Right? We don't want to do that. Uh, when it comes to theology. We don't want to do that when it comes to God's word. So let's remind ourselves and not, not force pieces into places that they do not belong. Remember, in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, God promised one whom he called the offspring of the woman. God made a promise. The Lord God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So there is one who is coming. Right? There is one who is coming. This is the picture. This is where we are at in, in redemptive history. There is one who is coming. One, by the way, not many. Right? The, the offspring is singular. Uh, it's, and that's actually made very evident if, as you read on there, because it says not they will bruise his head, but he will bruise his head. He will bruise the serpent's head. There is one who is coming, God promised, and it is this promise that God is bringing to fruition from that point onward. That, that, that's the focus of 
redemptive history. God bringing to fruition this promise of the offspring of the woman. And so the Abrahamic covenant is just another avenue, right, through which this promise will be realized. The Abrahamic covenant is just another avenue that, through which this promise will be realized. And that fruition, that completion of that promise, is foreshadowed in the promise that all the families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham, or, or Abram at this point, but just for ease, we're just going to refer to him as Abraham throughout, right? Begins as Abram, God renames him Abraham. Um, but the fruition of this promise is foreshadowed, it's, it's, it's foretold, it's hinted at, when God tells Abraham that all of the families of the earth will be blessed through him. All the families of the earth will be blessed, not just one, not just one particular family or one particular group, but, but all of them, all of the families of the earth. And this is the scope of the Abrahamic covenant that's really missed by many. This is the scope that, is, that many fail to understand, that, that the, the ultimate scope of these promises is that every family in the earth will be blessed. The purpose of this covenant was never that only one people or people group would be blessed. That was never the purpose. Others are ignored while one family is blessed. One, that was never the purpose of this covenant. Ultimately, all families of the earth will be blessed through this covenant. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing, God said to Abraham. All right? So the realization of this promise will come through one man who will become one family, who will become a nation, who will become a kingdom. And this is how God determined to bring about his promise of an offspring, his promise of a savior, his promise of a redeemer. And since a nation cannot be a nation, and a kingdom cannot be a kingdom without land, much of the focus in this uh, and, and, and future, the next uh, couple of covenants, much of the focus will be on the acquisition, the obtainment of this promised land. You can't be, really be a nation without land. You can't be a kingdom if you don't have land. And so much of the focus is going to be on that. In verse 7 we read, To your offspring I will give this land. To your offspring I will give this land. It's very important that we pay close attention to whom certain promises are being made. Very important in, in covenant uh, theology and understanding the covenants. Who are these promises being made to? If you, miss that, if you mix that up, it can really have ramifications and implications to, the, to other uh, aspects of your theology. Who are these, to whom are these covenant or promises being made? Well, the covenant members of the Abrahamic covenant, it is important to realize, are not all people. Right? We saw in the Abrahamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, that the covenant members were all people. Well, the covenant members of the Abrahamic covenant are not all people. So immediately we're going to start assuming, well, maybe some promises are for some and not for others. The promise of blessing does have in its scope, as we just saw, all the families of the earth, right? The promise of, of blessing through Abraham does have in part of its scope uh, all the families of the earth, but the promise of a land is to the offspring of Abraham only. That promise is to his offspring only, his physical offspring. There are temporal and eternal aspects of this covenant, okay? The Abrahamic covenant, there are temporal or, or in time, present, and then there are eternal aspects, and it's important that we get these straight. It is, it is uh, uh, vital that we identify them correctly. There are, basically speaking, three categories of promise in what we just read in Genesis chapter 12. Three categories of promise. First, there are promises to Abraham himself. Okay, Promises to Abraham himself. Second, there are promises to Abraham's offspring. And third... There is a promise that applies to the whole world. The promises to Abraham are, are these. We've just, read, we've just read them. God will bless him. God will make from him a nation. God will make his name great. God will protect him so that any, any who uh, curse him will be cursed, right? That promise that, uh, that many of you already know. These are the promises of God in this passage to Abram or Abraham himself. These are God's promises to the man, to Abraham. The promise of the land is to Abraham's flesh and blood offspring. Okay? And then there is a universal promise of blessing 
for all the families of the earth. Right? The universal promise of blessing through Abraham for all the families of the earth. And just as a little spoiler alert, spoiler alert we'll see this more as we go forward. And I'm all, I'm all, I never know what uh, theological understanding may be represented as we, as we sit here. There's a lot out there. But while the promise of blessing for all the families of the earth is not made explicit here, right? It doesn't say what that blessing is going to be. How are all the families of the earth going to be blessed? Right? God doesn't explain here exactly what that's going to be, what it's going to look like. Well, I can tell you that it will be far better than some of the theories out there. Right? This blessing is going to be far better than what some have surmised. I've heard some say that, that this promise, this, this blessing to be received by all the families of the earth was realized in the discovery of oil and other precious, bless, uh, precious commodities that have come from the land. Right? That's how all the families of the earth are going to be blessed, because there's been oil found uh, over there. I've heard it said that the promise of blessing has come through technological advancements, medical improvements, and new inventions. Right? This, this is how you know, Israel is going to bless all the, all the families of the earth. It's through these uh, uh, technological advancements. I've heard really outlandish speculations about land bridges and the dispersion of genetically pure descendants who carry with them this blessing in some kind of quasi-tangible sense uh, all over the world. And so this blessing spreads to every corner, every corner of the world in that way. Right? All these theories are out there, but, but brothers and sisters, the blessing is Christ and his salvation. All right, spoiler alert. The blessing is Christ and his salvation. He is the blessing. It is through him that the blessing comes. All right, cast aside all, all of the rest. They are nothing compared to what is actually the blessing. Isn't that far better? Doesn't that infinitely excel such other uh, trivial uh, ideas, some, such other navel-gazing nonsense? After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It's Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. As the gospel of Jesus Christ spreads, families are blessed. That is the blessing. The blessing can come in several forms within that, but that is the blessing. They all stem from Jesus Christ and his work of salvation. Some families will be blessed as, mem as a member or maybe members of that family are born again. Right? That's a blessing for the whole family. Even if only one member is born again, that's a blessing for the whole family. Others are blessed because they live in societies that were built for them by godly men who applied the wisdom of God's word to those communities. That's some ways that families are blessed because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of Christ and his salvation and how it redeems men and, and, and changes their hearts. And if nothing else, if nothing else, all are blessed with life, which is only granted to them because of the salvific work of Christ. Everyone has the blessing of life only because of the salvific work of Christ. He is still calling his sheep out of the fold. They are still hearing his voice. And as long as the divine process of gathering continues, the reprobate enjoy rain and sun in their seasons. They're being blessed. As long as that process of him calling his elect continues, every family in the earth is being blessed. Because they don't deserve their next breath. They deserve the wrath of God as we all do, without Christ. All families of the earth are blessed through Christ. The blessing is Christ and his salvation. But moving on, because there are yet two more chapters we need to study really quickly if we're going to get you know, a decent understanding of the Abrahamic covenant. If you've been attentive to our studies so far, you'll have noticed something. You'll notice that there's some components of covenant missing, aren't there? We haven't mentioned several components of what would necessarily compose a covenant. Uh, we have a covenanter so far, right? 
which as we said, we, we know that the answer to that is always going to be the same in divine covenants. There's a hint there. We know who the covenanter is. We know who the federal head is, the Abrahamic covenant. We have promises, but so far we have no stipulations or re-stipulations or sanctions, do we? We haven't outlined any of those. We'll turn now back to Genesis chapter 15. This, of course, was our opening text that we read through. And what we read is that Abraham is, is becoming old. Right? He's becoming old. And it's been some years since God called him out of Ur, as we read in Genesis chapter 12, and promised to make him a great nation. It's been, several, it's been almost a quarter of a century. And Abram is beginning to wonder how, how God is going to bring this about. How, how is God going to bring these promises to reality? I'm, I'm getting pretty old. Old people don't generally have children. How is God going to bring this about? And it seems, doesn't it, that God's people are, are always a bit short-sighted uh, and too limited when uh, it comes to the promises of God. Aren't we always a little short-sighted uh, and limited? We're always limiting our understanding of what God does to our own experiences, to our natural experiences. And isn't it the Father's patience? Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? The fatherly patience of God how it is displayed when he condescends to answer silly questions like, how will this be since I am a virgin? Or, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? God patiently explains to his people how he will bring about the promises he has made. Though he has no requirement to. He doesn't need to respond. He doesn't need to explain. But he graciously and condescendingly so often explains to his people. He says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And he went on to show them how he was going to bring about what he intended to do by feeding the 5,000, right? God patiently explains to his people quite often how he's going to bring about his promises. And he explains to Abraham in the same way. He explains to Abraham that he is faithful, that he is faithful and he will surely do what he has promised. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. I am your shield. Fear not. Those are the sweet and oft-repeated words of a sovereign kind God, often repeated throughout Scripture. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. God reiterates his promise to Abraham and assures him that it will come to pass. Even though Abraham is now beginning to question, not necessarily, we don't have evidence here that he's questioning God's integrity, but certainly, you know, how's this, this is starting to look pretty, uh, like a pretty difficult thing for you, God. How do you plan on, on bringing this about? Well, God answers him patiently. He reiterates his promise to Abraham and it assures him that it will come to pass. And then he goes on to reinforce that assurance visibly. He gives a visible reassurance of the promise. And he does so by means of a ceremony. A ceremony which we read, a, a ceremony in which he announces sanctions, doesn't he? He announces sanctions. And against whom are these sanctions? They're against himself. The sanctions that, that God imposes, that God threatens, as he's assuring Abraham that he will bring about his promises, these sanctions of God, he places against himself. We don't have time uh, this afternoon to explore the biblical and historical practices of covenant making. Maybe most of you have an idea that uh, what we see in this passage was actually a fairly common practice in this time. The dividing of the animals. Uh, two individuals entering into a covenant would slaughter animals and they would cut them in half. And then they would walk through the divided parts, the divided uh, carcasses, as an expression of their determination to carry out the covenantal stipulations and re-stipulations. 
They were basically saying, may I be like one of these animals if I don't keep my covenant responsibilities? May I become like one of them? May I be slaughtered? May I be destroyed? May the sanction of death come upon me if I break this covenant. That's what they were saying by, by dividing the animal, animals and walking through the parks. In our time, we might hear little children saying, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Right? Well, they do this to emphasize the solemnity of the promise being made. Right? The, uh, children do it to, to show how serious their, their promise is that they're making. Right? Uh, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. They also do it to emphasize the determination with which they intend to keep their promise. In other words, keeping this promise, no matter how difficult, will be far better than the consequences that will befall us if we break it. That's what's being said in these covenants. No one likes the idea of a needle in their eye. Right? So I'd rather just fulfill my promise than have a needle stuck in my eye. Or I'd rather have a needle stuck in my eye than break this promise. That's what's being said. But here, God the covenanter himself, the covenanter whom we've been studying so far, whom, whom we have seen at work in his creation, the covenanter himself is conveying that the sanction of death and destruction would befall him and him alone if the covenant promises are not realized. That's what, that's what God is saying here. Well, how did he say that? What do you mean? That's, I didn't read any of that. How is he saying that? Well, he demonstrated this by passing alone between the divided parts. He passed alone between the divided parts. A deep sleep fell on Abraham. Right? A deep sleep fell on him. And a flaming torch and a smoking fire pot, symbolizing the presence of God, passed through. The flaming torch and the smoking pot representing uh, God's presence. Because he would be present with his people, even as they were in bondage in Egypt. And he would be present with them as he led them out. The presence of God alone passed between the parts. John Gill said, quote, only, God, only God passed between the pieces, not Abram. This covenant, begin being, this covenant being, as others, God makes with men, only on one side. God, in covenanting with men promises and gives something unto them, but men give nothing to him, but receive from him, as was the case between God and Abram. End quote. This is the nature and character of our great God, of the covenanter. This is his nature and character on display. This is what our God does. He depends on no one. He depends on no one. He leaves nothing in the hands of another when it comes to his promises and purposes. He depends on no one. He carries out his promises. That's what's being displayed here when he passed along through the parts. <clears throat> Would Michelangelo have lent his brush to another and only directed the, the painting of the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel? No. Right? He, he, would have, he climbed the scaffolding himself and he, he laid there upon it for hours and hours until the really one of the highest works of the high renaissance was completed. Would he have given up his hammer and chisel and simply described the mental picture that he had of, of the statue of David, leaving the result to another? Would a great general merely write down his battle plans and tactics and leave his army to be led into war by someone else? No, and neither does God put the fulfillment of his promises in the hands of another. He passes through the parts himself. He is dependent upon no one. He is dependent upon no one. And do you think that you can resist him if he calls you unto salvation? Do you think that you can resist him, you simple and prideful person? You are no more than one of the bristles on his brush. You are no more than a drop of paint in his bucket through which he makes his masterpiece. Do you think that you autonomously determined yourself to be saved? Are you one of those puffed up ones who exclaims, I chose God, I am free? Tiny and helpless one. 
you no more gave God permission to do his will, to save you, than a rifle gives a soldier permission to employ it in battle. The rifle does what it was designed to do. God always, perfectly, and without fail brings to pass what he has promised and decreed. He passes between the parts alone. That is the ultimate sanction in the Abrahamic covenant. The sanction of death, God imposing it upon himself. Certainly, without losing any, if he did sleep, without losing any sleep over the matter, because he's going to bring it to pass. Though the ultimate sanction and responsibility were reserved by God for himself, we will see that there were actually other stipulations. Maybe we could call them minor stipulations, uh, even minor sanctions that were imposed upon the offspring of, of Abraham. We're going to turn to Genesis 17, so go ahead and turn there. Uh, you heard a little bit of this this morning uh, as well. So the, the, the ultimate sanction that was to keep the whole covenant purpose uh, moving forward was imposed against God himself, by himself. Um, but there are what we might call minor sanctions or secondary sanctions stipulations. Genesis 17. And we're going to read uh, 1 through 14. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or brought with your money, bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So here, a lot of what we see in this passage is, is reiteration. A lot of reiteration, a lot of restating what's already been said before. It's a reiteration of what we've already heard of the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham will be the father of many nations. Right? We've heard that now uh, a couple of times. And the land of Canaan will be given to his offspring. There's a promise of, of him being multiplied and a, and a promise of land. The promise of a blessing for the nations is, is still in view. Okay, that, that all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's, that's still in view, though it's not reiterated. Here, because the focus here in this passage is on the temporal aspects of the covenant more than the eternal, right? Those things that are pertaining specifically to the physical offspring of Abraham. So we see some reiteration here, some, some restatement of what we've already read. But we also see an expansion of the covenant. And there's an expansion here. Not only will a nation come from Abraham... But nations, nations, and not only nations, but also kings, 
now are said to, it is said that they will come from Abraham. Kingdoms will come from the line of Abraham. And with these promises, so these, these expansive promises, we see the, the promises expanding, with them comes another expansion. The re-stipulation of circumcision. This hasn't been mentioned so far. This is another expansion in the uh, covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. So we see expansion in promises, and we see expansion in the form of a re-stipulation, an, ex an expectation upon the covenant members. Every male among the descendants, nations, and kingdoms of Abraham is to be, cir is to be circumcised. Right? It is a, a sign in the flesh, uh, we just read. It's a sign in their flesh. And it's a sign of this. It's a sign that they have been set apart for a purpose, a very special purpose. They have been set apart as the people through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. They've been set apart for the purpose that through them, through Abraham's descendants, the Messiah will come. It's a sign in their flesh that from their flesh, that is from the line of Abraham, will one come through whom all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's what the sign represents. That this, is their, this, is, this is a representation of their membership in this covenant, in this process through which uh, the Messiah will come. So if any man refuses to be circumcised, he's in a sense refusing his participation in this, in this beautiful uh, uh, working out of God's promises. He's... he's, he's um, despising really his birthright, right? He's despising the, the right that he's been given to be born in this, uh, this line of descendants of Abraham through whom the Messiah would come. And so he rightly would be cut off from among the people of Israel. If he, ref if he, if he will not be circumcised, he will be cut off from the people of Israel. And so we see from this Another very important aspect of, of the Abrahamic covenant. That, that, the, that the promises of this covenant are general. In the sense that they, uh, besides the promises made to Abraham specifically, they're general. They're, they're made to many. Okay? Rather than personal, they're general. And, and, and God will fulfill his promises of uh, multitudinous posterity of Abraham. Of, of a physical land for that posterity of bringing that posterity into nationhood and kingdom, kingdoms, and of blessings all the fam blessing all the families of the earth. But these, these promises are general. They're made to, uh, to all the descendants of Abraham, those who are born from him, naturally. The, the, these promises are general. Individuals are not made these promises uh, directly. They can, they can cut themselves off from these promises, right? The, in, an individual descendant of Abraham could cut himself off from, uh, from these promises. They can fail to walk in covenant relationship according to the divine stipulations. And they can receive the sanction of, of being cut off. Right? If they refuse, if they refuse to participate in this covenant, they will be cut off. Whether that be through refusal of, of circumcision or uh, a denial of, of God or, or uh, you know, the form of apostasy. So the, the individual can be cut off. If an individual will not keep the covenant, he will lose his privilege of being part of the divine plan to bring redemption to the world through the offspring of the woman. That's what he'll, that's what he'll be trading. That's what he'll be losing. And consequently, he will also lose access to the other promises. The, the, the promised land. Right? He'll lose access to the promised land. He'll be cut off from the people. Um, this happened to the Israelites of, of the generation of the wilderness wandering, right? The, that whole, they wandered until that whole generation passed away in the wilderness because of their unbelief. It even happened to Moses. And he would lose access, this person who was cut off, he would lose access to the privileges and joys of his earthly citizenship in the nation or kingdom in which he formerly dwelled. So he'd be driven out from that nation or kingdom. This is what it would be mean for him to be cut off. These are the sanctions uh, against someone who is cut off, who, who breaks the covenant with God, the Abrahamic covenant with God. Now, notice 
or I hope maybe you've already noticed, that just as with the Noahic covenant, none of the promises or stipulations or sanctions, none of these, as they relate to the individual, have to do with eternal life, right? None of these promises, none, none of the stipulations, uh, none of this is, is, a, is a means by which someone in this covenant might attain life, attain eternal life. No one was ever saved by circumcision, okay? Let's just that be very clear. No one was ever saved by circumcision. No one was ever reconciled to God by their relationship to Abraham. No one was ever reconciled to God by their relationship to Abraham. Men and women have only ever been reconciled to God by their relationship to the offspring, to the seed of Genesis 22, to Jesus Christ. Men are reconciled to God through their relationship to Jesus Christ. Every person who has ever been born by ordinary procreation, from Adam forward, has been conceived in sin, has entered into this world with an original corruption for which they are guilty before God. Everyone. And that corruption in every man has erupted from their hearts like roadkill on a hot Texas day. In the fumes of idolatry, blasphemy, Sabbath breaking, dishonoring of parents, murder, adultery, theft, lies, and covetousness. In short, spiritual death. And the end of spiritual death is physical death and eternal death. The only way any man, woman, or child has ever been reconciled to God has ever had their sins forgiven, ever received the righteousness and holiness without which they would, would never see God, is through Jesus Christ. Only through their relationship to Jesus Christ. No one has ever been saved by their relationship to Abraham or anyone else. By faith, knowing and trusting in the sufficient work of Christ, the free gift of salvation is received. It is never earned. Not by circumcision, not by church attendance, not by family lineage. You're not a Christian just because your parents are. Right? Not by baptism, not by any works of righteousness which you have done, but according to God's mercy are we saved. And if you are here today, and you continue to deny Him, you continue to deny Him, even though we've seen such glorious things about our covenanting God, God who never fails, who always keeps his promises. Know this. Every sermon under which you sit adds to your condemnation. You are not neutral. You are either for Christ or you are against him. You leave here worse than you came in if you are outside the covenant of grace because the truths you hear are will condemn you for eternity. Every sermon that you sit through denying Christ is, is a heaping of your condemnation upon yourself. Be circumcised in your hearts today. Cry out to God to have the old flesh removed. Be set apart and holy by the work of the Holy Spirit. Or you will be cut off. You will be cut off from the blessings, joys, peace of the covenant of grace will be cast into the refuse heap as the foreskin is discarded after circumcision. You will be cut off and cast into the furnace where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a promise of God as much as any other. And he never fails in his promises. He never fails in his promises. In case there's any confusion about the Abrahamic covenant, know this. He never fails in his promises. He never fails in his covenant. He blessed Abraham. He did bless him, right? If you know anything about God's word, if you know anything about the, the story of Abraham, the, 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 the historical recording of his life, he was greatly blessed. God multiplied his offspring, who became nations and kingdoms. The Israelites did receive the land of promise, right? God keeps his promises. And the seed became incarnate. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 says, 
the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It says this because God never fails in his covenants. So in conclusion, this is kind of a summary. Of what, what is the Abrahamic covenant all about? The Abrahamic covenant moved the timeline of history closer to the fulfillment of the promise of a Messiah. Right? That's, what it was, that's what it was there for. By the divine promise that in Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Quote, In successive stages, God made a covenant with Abraham, promising him that his multiplied offspring would inherit Canaan and live there under their own rulers after a period of several hundred years of sojourning and slavery. God will assuredly make this happen. As for Abraham and his descendants, they must keep this covenant by circumcising their males on the eighth day. If they do not keep the covenant, they will be disinherited, not as a nation, but as individuals. From among the children of Abraham, one of them will bring a blessing for all the families of the earth, for all nations. End quote. One will come. One will come. And praise God, he has come. Amen? Amen? He has come. And praise God, he is come. He is come. Our God keeps his promises. Hopefully this has cleared up for some of us some of the confusion around the Abrahamic covenant. How you know, has God failed in these covenants? If you have any questions, please feel free to see Trent or I love to discuss these things more with you, but in, in, in that, uh, I'm not sure what I'm about to say. Whether or not you come to us after with questions, let us pose in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the revelation that you are a promise-keeping God. We love you for who you are. We love you for what you've done, for how you've shown this uh, in, in your word, shown us in, in time, your faithfulness throughout the generations. You have never failed. You always keep your promises. You have never failed to accomplish what you have said you would accomplish. And so we have the great confidence that, that our salvation, those who, those who are in Jesus Christ, our salvation is sure that he will come again, as he said. Father, I pray for the softening of hearts of those who are still uncircumcised in their hearts uh, today. I pray that they would see you all of your wonder. They would see the Messiah about, about whom all of history uh, or around whom all of history revolves. That they would be, not be as those who are cast off from the blessings. Cast off from blessings. Not cast off from, from duties and drudgery, but from blessings. May they see the blessings in Jesus Christ desire them above all else. And for your saints, may they go out from here encouraged, knowing a little more of, of their great covenanting God, and being able to face anything this week, because our, their God keeps his promises. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name.